All right, ClubWWI.com members, uh, this is James Gutman. And, you know, we have a lot of people on here who talk about seeing a lot of things in TNA, but no one has seen more in TNA than this person who's been with them uh, pretty much on and off almost since they began. Uh, she has been in the ring. She has worked outside the ring. Uh, she's one of the most beautiful women you've seen in wrestling. And, guys, she's the best thing to happen to schoolgirl outfits since the invention of plaid, the one and only Miss Tracy Brooks. Tracy, how are you? Good. Thank you for that. <laughs> no, you're welcome. Before anything, before we even get into your career, how is uh, how's everything by you? What's going on in the world of Tracy Brooks? Uh, not much. Just uh, still doing indies and conventions and stuff like that and still working. We're working away, and that's about it. Pretty boring life. I was- I'll tell you, it's one of the one of the funny things that I've seen. I think a lot of fans who uh, who have watched you uh, on and off in TNA, uh, you know, really from the beginning, is that I mean, you have uh, a distinct backstory that I think amazes people. I was watching your TNA webography this morning, uh, talking about how uh, if it wasn't for wrestling, you probably would have been a pig farmer. Which yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I actually I grew up in St. Mary's, Ontario, Canada, and Happy Canada Day, yeah, Happy Canada Day to everybody, I should say. Um, July first is Canada Day, so. Um, yeah, I grew up on a pig farm until I was 19 years old. I went to college after that. But, yeah, I was supposed to go and take over the, my dad's pig farm, and, and, you know, that's how I was supposed to spend the rest of my life. Wow. It's got to be. I mean, you talk about it. Kind of went a different direction. There, I mean, I don't think anybody's ever – I mean, I've heard stories about people, well, I would have been a teacher, I would have been – but that, I think, is the most opposite of what you ended up doing. Not only are you a, a knockout, but, I mean, a lot of this stuff, you know, sometimes when I do the uh, the graphics for our guests, I have a hard time finding pictures of them. I had no problem finding a picture of you. There's pictures of you everywhere. I mean, you went from being, you know, not just becoming a wrestler, but becoming, you know, a model essentially for Playboy and different things that you did. So, I mean, it's a real, it's a real big change. Yeah, and actually, that's the hard, I always find that's the hardest part, the modeling. It's the part I don't, I like the least. I understand why we have to do it and stuff, but that to me is the hardest part. So, I'm just a tomboy at heart, and I, I love the physicality of the ring and, and the match part and the acting part of it. it it's the, it's the modeling and girl part I have an issue with. Oh, man. <laughs> Well, it seems like everybody kind of does that, too. A lot of the times you see the wrestlers out there, and, and they take those promo shots, and sometimes they just don't look too comfortable, you know? No, it is a hard process to get used to. So I got – I mean, it's obviously um, a long way. I got a lot used to it, and I've met a lot of great people uh, to help me out. Like Christy Hemi, I love doing photo shoots with her, or SoCal Val. So um, I find I'm better with somebody. <laughs> so mm-hmm. kind of usually makes for of. a better shot. Everybody's kind of staring at you, that kind of, you know, what's everybody looking at? Yeah, and our, our photographer, Lee South, at TNA was incredible. Like, he's amazing. And he, I actually, he is in the same boat as me. He actually started at TNA, and it's so funny because I used to always tease Lee. He'd be like, you wouldn't even look in the camera to take a picture. And now he's like, okay, um, take off your top and uh, do a sexy back picture. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll do that. Well, I mean, you, you were with, I think, a lot of people we talk about, I said before, TNA. People say, oh, they've gone through so many changes. But, I mean, literally, I, I went back, and we, we just had Goldilocks on last week. I had interviewed her. And she's somebody people think of when they think of TNA originals. But you've been there really on and off since, since like, 2002. I mean, you've seen you've seen everything in TNA. But for yeah, you, what I was, start, it was April 2003 I started, um, and I came in as a schoolgirl. So it, it was, yeah, I've seen everything. I've seen it. I mean, it's never had any downs. It's always just been, TNA's always, you know, rise. It's always been a... a uh, you know, uphill thing. It's never really, it's never really had any ups and downs. It's always just had an up. Like everything's, you know, we went from um, three hour or two hour, three hour pay per views. I can't even remember it was so long ago. You know, pay per views, and then we went to Fox News. We went to like Impact an hour. Then we went to Prime Time two hours, and then it just, it's been skyrocketing ever since. It's incredible. It's been. I, I think it's it, it's one of those things that does a lot about you because you know, I mean, the company's obviously gone through so many different people working there. Jeff's been there for a long time, then Dixie came in, and Hogan came in. And the fact that you continuously keep going back there, I mean, I think it says a lot about how the company sees you and, and some of the things you've done. Yeah, I've been really blessed. I mean, I did get released in March, and, and it wasn't everyone, you know, I go to the Indies and everybody like, hey, Barry TNA. It's like I have nothing but respect and love for TNA. I mean, obviously my husband's still there, and I still watch every Thursday night and go down and visit. And I mean, I, I came back in February to do a little thing with Cookie and Robbie, and I worked four house shows in April, and it's never not that I've been gone. It's just, you know, I show up whenever once in a while, and I think that's what's great about it, too. You can never get sick of me this way. <laughs> no, well, on top of that, too, it must be good for you because you hear from a lot of people that, you know, I mean, you're kind of in a spot where it's cool because you can go back and you can work with this company and it gets exposure, but at the same time, you're not kind of tied into that where you have to go here, and, and I think it makes it a little bit easier to kind of enjoy yourself when you're working with that kind of schedule sometimes. Yeah, I definitely have my freedom, which is great. I mean, with CNA, it was great, too, because you did have your freedom to do things like I did Playboy. I went to Iraq twice to visit the troops, and, 
you have a, the schedule. I mean, the, they're running just as much as WWE right now, I think, the house shows and stuff. But you still have that a little bit of lack where you can kind of go and do other things and explore other things if you want to act or model or do whatever. So I think that's a great, great thing. Because I think it also brings exposure to the company as well. There's a lot of new people, too, that are in there that have that kind of background. Like, I think, you know, the more people that kind of work with TNA, the more opportunities kind of arise just based on the people you're backstage with. You know, obviously, yeah, exactly. coming in, yeah, it probably opened up a lot more doors. It definitely. Well, let me ask you about this, because one of the things, you know, people talk a lot about uh, TNA storylines, and sometimes they say, well, this got dropped or this got moved. I think in all the time in TNA, and I, I talked about it at the time, too, one of the best storylines they ever did uh, were you, it was you and Bobby Roode, Robert Roode. Oh, cool. Thank you. I thought, I thought it was great. What I liked the most about it, though, I thought, was, um, you know, if people don't remember, it was, you know, you, you were managing him. He kind of had you, under, you know, over a barrel, kind of stuck up with him. Mm-hmm. Um, but they didn't just make it a matter of you stuck with him because you, you know, just like wrestling. They, they actually gave you a backstory, a full backstory with you, you know, trying to support medical bills and things like that. Uh-huh. That must have been an amazing storyline because it touched a lot of nerves of people because it touched on, you know, physical, mental abuse, things like that, and you kind of being the strong woman who stands up in the end. I mean, that, that whole storyline of working with Robert must have been amazing. It was because he he played such a great asshole. You know what I mean? Like he played such a great uh, a character. But the thing is, a lot of there's a lot of real life relationships like that. Unfortunately, where people stay with an abusive, you know, uh, physically or emotionally abusive person, man or woman, you know, because they think they have no other option. They're stuck because they have kids or you know what I mean. They're stuck, and they always there's always an excuse. And I think it related with people. And it was funny when you know the whole. My favorite thing is when Kazarian came in and. Um, try to, you know, you don't have to stay here and that whole thing. I thought that was awesome. I thought they worked really well together. But that was definitely my favorite storyline. Working with Eric Young, it was great, too. I, I, loved, being the, I loved being the bitch. It was awesome. Loved it. <laughs> I, thought, I thought the whole thing was, one of my favorite lines, um, you know, you're just a prick named Bobby. I thought that was one of my <laughs> favorite lines ever. And then the slap. Well, it was I, of- I, I, I loved managing because, A, you got to wrestle. I got to do a lot of mixed tags. Um he managed, I got to talk. Uh, Robert always used me. He was great with the manager because he always used me for a cutoff. He always used me in every match. Um, you got to ask. You got to do everything as a manager. You never got sick. It was, I was never like a – it was never stale. I was never – because, you know, I always got to do different things. I, you know, people didn't get sick of me wrestling because I only wrestled, you know, once in a while and mixed tag matches or something. So I think it was such a great I, – I was, I was really blessed to be in that storyline. It was fun. It was a lot of fun, too. Yeah. I mean, it definitely, it definitely had a had a tinge of reality to it on top of everything else. Plus, I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it, it really made you kind of this, this sympathetic kind of good guy character, which was tough because you had up until that point kind of played that that heel and whatever. So, I mean, to be able to get the audience on your side after after so many of the things that had happened uh, with yeah. your character, I mean, it says a lot about about how the storyline was written and how you guys performed it. I, I think that was I, that's the part I love is about wrestling. I mean, it's the wrestling part too, but it's the even in this day and age, grasping the crowd. Like being able to have the crowd turn with you, and I mean, again, the Kazarian angle. When I remember when he kissed my hand, like a crowd of, I think there was like a bloody tables match before us. In a day and age when there's like glass matches, tax, you know, all these strong style yeah. matches, the fact that the crowd can still go off when a man kisses a woman's hand, like you know what I mean? It's still people still relate to that kind of stuff. They still relate to the Macho Man Elizabeth kind of thing. So I thought it was a really cool. That's still in this day and age we could get them to do that. Well, that's, I, you know what gets me, I think, sometimes that wrestling tends to miss, and I think that storyline played into it, and WWE, I think, sometimes forgets about this, is that there are female fans out there, and a lot of mm-hmm. the things, I remember, you know, my, my wife now, my, she was my girlfriend back then, the, the test Stephanie McMahon angle, when they were going out on the date, and they were going to get married, and things like that, something that she always remembered, and I think sometimes wrestling promotions forget that, you know, there is another segment of the audience that, that likes that kind of that drama, and that, that thing, sometimes it doesn't always have to be bloody faces kind of slamming yeah. each other into the ground, it's kind of an emotion. There's still definitely, there's a ton of, I mean, you look at it, there's nothing but, you know, half-naked men running around, you know, all oiled up. Of course, there's a ton of women fans, like women fans. And they relate to that storyline. And the thing I remember most is the Randy Elizabeth, you know, when they got back together. And there's guys in the crowd, I think it was was SummerSlam they got back when? Oh, I I, I don't mean he had seven with a guy in the crowd crying. Yeah, that's what kills me. It's like, you can still work on that emotion. So that's what I like about it. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, it says a lot, too, because, I mean, the job of you guys at the end of the day is really to kind of emotionally connect with these people and to make them want to want to see good things happen to you or, you know, bad things happen to you. And I think that's one of the, the reasons why, the, especially with Kazarian, it works so well is because people knew who you were. They kind of they felt this emotional attachment to you. I think sometimes wrestlers today, some of them forget about that, about kind of connecting with the fans. They think about moonsaults and drop kicks, but it's mm. really about getting people to care about you yourself and, and what you do, uh, you know, in the storylines and in the ring. Exactly. I mean, it's getting it's to know your crowd, too. I think it I think a great wrestler is not how many moves you know technically or how technical you are. It's going out there in front of 50 people and knowing what they want to see or what they haven't seen yet in the card or going out there in front of 1,500 people and, and, you know, showing them. And that, to me, is what a good wrestler is. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you about about your training because obviously you know people probably ask you about this. You, you trained under under uh, the person who, who trained you know Edge Christian uh, Trish Stratus, mm-hmm. Ron Hutchinson up in yeah. Canada. That must have been uh, an experience. This is somebody who who really I think long term now as you look back trained so many great people. I mean, how much of that was kind of taught to you in, in the ring? Was a lot of that focused on, on wrestling, or did you did you kind of figure it out early? Um, well, it's a funny story. It's my very first day of training. Christian was there, and I was like, oh, this isn't intimidating at all. <laughs> Um, wow. And that was the one good thing I could say about Ron. His students always came back. I mean, Joey Legend, Christian always came back. Edge came back. Um, Trish was there. I mean, Trish didn't even have to learn how to wrestle. She took the pot, that upon herself to go and learn how to wrestle. She was only there for maybe two months before she went on the road with Heat, I think it was, with um, Preston Albert. Oh, yeah. And uh, But it was cool. I mean, not only I was training with, you know, I remember Christian was teaching me how to chop and punch my very first day. and. Um, we did a lot of calisthenics. <laughs> that was one thing about Ron. It was um, all about your core and your 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 uh, cardio and stuff like that. And uh, he taught me how to be safe and how to say no and how to protect yourself, which I think is the most important thing, and especially in girls. Um, you, you know, your body is your money, and and you can say no. It's okay to say no, like to some things, if you don't feel comfortable doing that. And you have to protect yourself. You don't want to be doing something stupid and risk getting hurt and ruining your career. Well, it seems uh, no, obviously. I mean, that's that's the kind of thing that's that's most important. I think that a lot of teachers need to teach the students. But for you, I mean, going in there the first day and seeing famous people there, I, I always talk to a lot of a lot of young wrestlers who they go on Google and they search for a teacher and they get somebody who pretends that they were somebody under a mask yeah. twenty years ago. And they were, so when you walk into school and you see you know legitimate students from the past who, who have succeeded coming back and working with them, uh, I mean, it seems to me like sometimes a no brainer. Like if, if you're going to get trained, you got to find somebody who's the best they can do. So it must have. Uh, must have at least been good for you. You know, you made the right choice when you walked in. Well, actually, Ron was also, um, he also, when I actually started, I sent in, I won a modeling contest, and I sent the pictures into uh, WWF at the time, and Kevin Kelly actually called me back and said, you look great, but how do we know how you move? We need to, you need to have a tape, you need to be trained, which is funny now, because they hire a lot of girls, and they teach them themselves. Yeah. But, I mean, times have changed. Um, but, so they said, you need to go get trained. They actually recommended Ron's school, and, um, when I went and met with Ron, he's like, you know, you can call the Athletic Commission of Ontario, Canada, and he was he was registered there, and he had insurance. He had he was just a he was just a very professional school. Like he did it very professionally. And and back on Ontario, girls could only work with girls. So if there wasn't a girl in there for me to work, I was doing calisthenics. Oh wow! I wasn't in the ring with the guys. So unfortunately, when I started, Trish left, and then I was back to doing calisthenics. And then another girl came in. She quit. I started calisthenics again. Another girl came and she quit, and then Gail Kim came in, and we basically just fast tracked so we could start uh, start having matches and stuff. So we trained four days a week, but three hours a day. Man, and it's gotta be cool too. I mean, you mentioned Gail Kim, but that's somebody that you worked with in TNA. It must be great to get to work work with people that you train with, and then now get to do it on TV, and it's kind of like old times again. But you're you're out there doing it in front of a, a live it, crowd and, and on. Television. It is. I, I've been very blessed because even Beth Phoenix, I consider that I trained with her too. Even though she's American, I consider her, she's a good old Canadian girl. But uh, Beth and I did a ton of indies together, and, and uh, I mean, Gail and I did our first 100 matches together. Oh, wow. And then, I mean, just to get back in the ring, and, 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 you know, I mean, Gail and I have known each other for almost 11 years now. So, I mean, it's incredible how our friendship has, you know, we've been in and out of the ring together for 11 years. It's been incredible. Yeah. I mean, just knowing the people, you know, and that's one of the things that, you know, comes up a lot, too, is, is having a good relationship with people that you work with and being around them. Uh, I want to ask you about Frankie Kazarian, because in wrestling – uh, relationships that people have outside the ring. Obviously, you guys are married. Um, I, you sometimes hear good and bad, but from what I've heard from people who know you and, and different people, is that you guys, I mean, you guys are, are happy. You guys are, have a good relationship. Is there a secret to that, do you think, for a lot of people out there who, you know, maybe are married in wrestling and sometimes kind of get caught up in the uh, in the hoopla backstage? 
just be best friends. I mean, he's my best friend. That's I think that's simple. You be your best friend, and you're you're understanding to your best friend, and you're you know you you just you understand, and it's just being best friends, and you know everyone gets caught up in the word love and stuff, but I mean it takes more than love. It's friendship and understanding and respect for each other, and I think it's also easier because I know what ha- like I I understand the road too, so it's a lot easier. Yeah. So, and we never, it, I mean, our our schedules are so busy, it's hard to, we appreciate all the time we have together, because sometimes, it, you know, we don't see each other every day. And that's an awesome outlook to have. I think there's a lot of people out there who, you know, I mean, they hear sometimes horror stories from different people in the business, and, oh, this happened, that happened. But it, it's, I mean, it's just a matter well, of... Well, it's funny, because my girlfriends really that have been married for 10 years that see their husband every day, they work normal 9-to-5 jobs, they're like, I wish my husband would go overseas for a week. <laughs> and I'm like, I wish my husband would be home for a week. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go to Iraq for a week and get away from yeah. this guy? You know? yeah, and it's funny. It's just you appreciate and you understand you're, you're best friends with someone. You don't have the exact same um, ideas and the exact same, but that's what makes it, you know, he's introduced me to cool stuff, and I've introduced him to cool stuff. And, you know, it's just a we're both really blessed, I guess. That's all you can say. Just very patient, understanding, and just we're best friends. Absolutely. I mean, and especially, you know, the fact that you guys have worked together both on TV um, and, and in TNA. And, and one of the other questions, too, that I know fans uh, have always probably wondered, the, the whole angle that you had done, uh, where you were the TNA uh, knockout law uh-huh. in China V, um, very kind of quick angle. I know a lot of people remember it at the time because it was, you know, TNA was really focusing on the knockdowns. They had you kind of doing the, you know, I love kind of being that, in charge of the whole division. I loved it. I think it was just a time where Mick Foley came in and Jeff Jarrett was coming back to TV and Jim Cornette was on TV. There was just a lot of, um, like, Cornette was a CEO, and then Jeff was coming back as a founder, and then Mick was coming in as a as a <laughs> boss, too. So it was just, someone's got to get bumped, and I think that's all it was. There's there's only so much time for a storyline. So I like that no, idea you're... because I thought it was, there's never been a female boss of just the females. And I think, like, like I could go into the locker room and yell at them, or, like, story, or I could go into the shower and yell at them where a guy couldn't, or... I liked refing the matches because I could touch the girls where the guys couldn't. It's like that kind of thing. So I thought it was a really cool idea. Well, it, it would have worked. I mean, one of the things that I thought was great about it when it played out was because so often they, they do the angles where the females try to seduce the, the male boss, and I don't think it would have worked as well on you. Yeah, it was neat. But, I mean, unfortunately, as you said, there's only so, as I said, there's only so much time, and unfortunately some things get cut, and that happened. So. I don't know exactly. Well, that's one of the things that with, with TNA that, I mean, it, it, it's good, but at times it can kind of mess things up a little bit. You know, you talk about Jeff coming back, I mean, Foley coming in. There's so many people right now. The wrestling business is, is so huge. There's so few places to work that on, on one hand, there's so many people who want to come into TNA that sometimes, you know, it's great to bring new people in, but sometimes it kind of feels like you, know, you get to try to find a way to wedge different people into into different situations to be able to showcase them. Yeah, I, I, I almost wish TNA would just get another show. <laughs> yeah, right? I think hands down TNA has some like has the best talent. I really do, and I mean, I love the fact that they're doing the whole wrestling matters things because it's the exact opposite of the other company, and I think it's really neat. And I just, I, you know, they just need more time. So I think that's all TNA does is they just need another show. I actually agree with you. I think I, I remember when they went to two hours. I wasn't too happy with, with the two hour show, but I, I think, that, like you said, maybe not necessarily a brand split, but just like WWE has a SmackDown, they have Raw, yeah. so they can showcase everybody, and they don't have to worry about trying to get everybody into that two hours. I know Explosion's doing really well, and they're building storylines on Explosion and stuff like that overseas, and, and you can see it online and stuff, which is good. But I, I think, hands down, TNA has the most incredible talent, and it's just, unfortunately, there's just not enough time. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, it kind of comes down to uh, to just whoever uh, whoever can get out there at the time. I want to ask you one of the things that was was curious about when you when you made the return earlier this year to TNA. They actually had you uh, you you'd gone over the the women's champion. Was that right at the house show? Yeah, it was not title. <laughs> Oh, but still, it speaks a lot. I mean, to put somebody over who, who's not even necessarily on the roster over over the champion. I mean, how did that? How were you approached about that? Have you been told about that? And was there any like, well, no, am I gonna... no. I mean, just it just happened backstage, and, and Madison's awesome, and she understood, and it was just just to make that crowd happy, kind of. And Mickey James was also out there. So, I mean, it's not like I was there by myself. Mickey James was out there. She was in um, Storyline where she got hit by the car, or the motorcycle. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, and. Um, and she couldn't work, so she brought me out, and it was neat. It was just, uh, it was nice that the fans. I was worried the fans wouldn't know who I was. <laughs> oh wow! But when Mickey oh, introduced no, no. me, it was, um, it was really nice, and it was a cool moment. I mean, Madison was awesome. She's, uh, I think, funny thing is, Madison. I um, I used to work Madison when she was Lexi, Lexi Lane. I don't gosh, she's gonna be mad at me if I don't remember. In Ohio, 
And I actually okay. recommended her to TNA to get hired because I thought she was a great talent. She can obviously talk and work, and she looks great. So I'm really proud of her. That's good. I think a lot of times – it's funny, too, because I ask you that question, and sometimes you hear from fans, and, and especially on the Internet, there's so much over-analysis of, of all oh. these things that happen. And how often – because I've talked to people before. I go, what's the, what's the reason behind this name? Was it because of this? Was it because of that? They were like, well, Pat Patterson walks up and was like, this is your name, and that's my name. Uh, I mean, do you think – isn't it funny that sometimes it, it does come off that fans think there's so much behind it, but usually a lot of these decisions are made, you know, backstage, they go, I go, let's win. <laughs> and that's kind of like where it goes. I just wish fans would watch it as a fan. Like, just be yeah. a fan. Be a fan like you're a football fan. Don't be an armchair, you know, quarterback or armchair, you know, just just be a fan. Just watch it. Don't think, just watch. Just watch it and enjoy it. Yeah, you can be frustrated or, you know, some things and just watch it. You're a wrestling fan. If you're not a fan and you, you don't, it doesn't bring you happiness or emotion like it should, then why do you watch it? I don't understand that. <laughs> I don't understand why people want to watch it and be negative. Like, it really frustrates me. I used to watch wrestling when I was a kid, and I'd just be like, I couldn't wait to sit down in front of the TV and, and, uh, and like, well, I actually was, I actually, don't put this as your headline. I hope Hogan wasn't my favorite as a child. Oh, no. All right. <laughs> Hulk Hogan, I'm trying to tell me exactly here. Hulk Hogan. Yeah, Hulk yeah. Hogan. Don't put that as a headline. <laughs> I was never, uh, like, I was never a Hulkamania. I was always, like, I loved Rick Rude. I loved, um, Kurt Henning. I loved Bobby the Brain Heenan. I loved, like, I, I was, a, I, loved, I loved the heels, basically. Um, oh. Kimbo was the only baby face I liked. But I used to want to sit in front of the TV and be amused and be happy and, be you know, watch the show and not think. And I don't understand why people just can't do that. Do you think it's too just much? watch it because it makes you happy. Well, I want to ask you, do you think it's just too much? Is it, I mean, obviously TNA has the one show, but and I've noticed this with other forms of entertainment too, TV shows and movies, that people, it, there, there's just so much entertainment out there now, YouTube, and you can watch anything you ever want to watch, that it just kind of mm-hmm. seems like, Everybody, you know, rather than being excited about watching something, it's kind of like they're already sick. They've already watched too much of something before it even airs on TV. Yeah, absolutely. Spoilers and, I mean, because you read the spoilers and be like, oh, I don't want to watch this, or I'll watch this, and they fast forward through TiVo. I mean, mm-hmm. yes, I know the Internet's here and we can't do anything about it, but sometimes I wish it just, you know, the dirt sheets would go away. And not that I have a problem with the dirt sheets. I'm just saying that I wish that, because sometimes it just ruins it. I just want people to turn the show on at 9 o'clock or uh, – Nine o'clock, TiVo it or whatever, and just watch it and watch what happens and not be able to know the results of the matches. But you can't do anything about it, so you can't fight it or work around. You know, it. We can't throw every single, you know, person out there that's writing it on their phone or writing it down or on the laptop or something. I mean, it, it's here, so we have to deal with it. Unfortunately. I think one of the things that you do with uh, with interacting with the fans, especially online, I, I was looking at your Twitter page. Um, I think I'm, I think I follow you on Twitter. I sell stuff. <laughs> what's that? All I do is sell stuff. <laughs> no, not only that, but you answer the fans, which I think was really cool. Yeah. People ask you questions. A lot of times these guys, and, and I'm, I'm not going to name names, but a lot of times people you see on Twitter, it's kind of like they use it as an extension to stay in the spotlight. And it's like, well, you know, I get it. All right, yeah. eating a sandwich. You know, and you hear a lot. But you, you don't do that. I think you interact with your fans in, in a positive way where they can no, they I do. I do. And not too much. Any negativity I block. I mean, I don't even respond to it. I just block. If you say anything negative about any wrestling, anybody, any storyline, anything, I block because I just don't like negativity in my life. Like, if someone's very negative about the business and talking to me, I'm nothing but positive because that pisses people off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. But I think, um, I, I, I don't know, they, they take the time to, I mean, sometimes I'm gone, I'm out of the country or something, I can't get to them or something, I can't answer every single one, but I try. I mean, if this person's reaching out to me and asking me about something, or I feel like it's my obligation to, to especially if it's nice or positive or something, that I should answer them. And I think that's why Frankie's great, too, because he tries to talk not about wrestling. I mean, he retweet like, if someone takes a really cool picture of, like, the Fortune 4 sign, he takes time to retweet it. Or, But he also tell, like, talks about his other interests. You know, hey, I like music, hey, I like this band, or hey, I like this kind of thing, to kind of get fans, you know, this is all, this is this is me outside of wrestling. Oh, exactly. Well, then, it's to kind of get them to get to know you, which I think is that's yeah. why a lot of people follow these people on Twitter. And I think sometimes... And it, you see people kind of get confused with that, and that's what I think is great. Like, someone will follow you on Twitter. They want to know about you. They want to know about the things you do. But then some of these people get on there, and all of a sudden it's, you know, hey, everybody, make sure you do this. And, hey, guys. And sometimes it kind of seems like a little too much. But I think what's cool about it is that, you know, the way you kind of interact with people, it, it's positive in, in just how you respond to them even. You know, and it kind yeah. of leaves maybe people well, more negative with a more positive view of, of you and, and the business itself. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't – I'd be a pig farmer. 
<laughs> I wouldn't be having this interview with you. I wouldn't be working. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't have been able to do the things I've done. So if it wasn't for the fans, I'd be nowhere. <laughs> so people forget that. Oh, absolutely. I, I think. Uh, I, I, I get annoyed with them, though. Just, Don't get me wrong. I still get annoyed and frustrated with them. <laughs> no. What would they be annoyed or frustrated about? <laughs> I want to say, see, I'm keeping it positive though, because I want to ask you about uh, about WWE, because obviously you're probably asked a million times. This is a question that I find that most TNA people are asked is about WWE, and most WWE people are asked if they're ever going to go to TNA. So obviously you're asked a lot. So for anybody out there wondering, uh, what are your thoughts on WWE? Is it something that you've pursued? Is it something that you would like to do in the future? Is the schedule something that you're not? Really no, I'm. What are your thoughts? I'm. A, I'm likely too old. So I mean, I know they're hiring really young right now, and I can't do anything about my age. So. Um, no, I, I, I like WWE. Obviously, I, I, um, some of my best friends are in WWE. I watch every week and support. I think which every wrestling fan and wrestler should do. Um, I did try my first tryout with WWE was 2002. I went to a house show in Sarnia, and then they called me back the next day, and I went to a pay per view in Detroit. And I just I had tryouts, and I worked Molly a few times, just in like day matches, and then. Uh, like Gail Kim and Beth Phoenix and I had a, some tryouts and stuff, and they hired Gail Kim right away, and then I actually went to TNA right after that tryout. Okay. So I've been with TNA ever, and I was just happy with TNA every time my contract came up. So I was just, just always, I guess TNA was always for me. Yeah. I mean, you raised an interesting point too when you said about about the age changing. We talked about it earlier about how they're they're hiring girls who maybe don't have a history in wrestling. They're teaching them wrestling when they're there. It, it's changed kind of the the longevity that a lot of females have in wrestling because it kind of feels like nowadays, you know, once you, once you reach a certain point, they'd rather let you go than pay you more and kind of bring yeah. somebody brand new and, and, and rebuild them. Well, I, I think that's just, I mean, the age thing is known, and, and I'm not that age group, so I can't do anything about it. So why be pissed off about it and just move on? I don't I don't feel like I look old or can't move or, or uh, you know, perform in the ring like any of them, but... I have the wrestling background, and I've been a wrestler for 10, 11 years, so they don't want that. They want the exact opposite, So, and that's what they want, So, and they get it. And I have nothing wrong with the Divas. I think they're beautiful and talented. I think they all work. At least I think they all work hard. I don't know a lot of them, so. Well, I'll tell you this much. We're we're pretty much almost the same age, and uh, and there's a lot of people my age that I, I don't think look like Tracy Brooks. So I'll <laughs> like Thank that. you so much. I wouldn't be concerned. Let me ask you this. One of the last questions I want to ask you. We ask all of our guests the same question. Uh, if you could choose anyone, maybe someone you grew up watching, maybe somebody who you just haven't been in the same company with, they say, I wish I could, you know, at any time period, I wish I could have worked with this person. Who would you pick? Oh, God, Sherry Martel. Uh, Gail Kim and I had a match, and Sherry actually uh, commentated it, her and Ted Petty. And Sherry pulled us into the bathroom after our first match and said, you two are going to be somewhere one day. And to me, that was the most amazing and incredible thing she's ever said. And I wasn't at TNA when she was there, and she did that thing with Robert Roode that day. I wasn't there, unfortunately. But, uh, um, yeah, I think Sherry, I'd love to work a program with her. I think she's awesome. Uh, I think she wasn't scared to make an ass of herself. She was still sexy. She did her role amazingly. Um, definitely in something with Elizabeth and Macho Man, because I, God rest her soul, I grew up hating Elizabeth. I hated everything about her, her hair, her nails, her... You know, it was everything I was against, and I just, but now when I got into the business, I realized how incredible she was, and, you know, she did her job well, and and now I also realize that SoCal Val is that. <laughs> so, but yeah, definitely, I think those guys. Man, well, she, I mean, Sherry is one of those people that I, I, very few people even came close to doing what she did. I mean, no one could really duplicate her. You know, she's, nope. nowadays, sometimes people talk about carbon copy divas and, and different females in wrestling. You can't really Sherry duplicate was, her either, because it's hard to duplicate because you don't get the free will kind of to duplicate her. I mean, and I think a lot of girls are scared to make, like, no, I don't think a lot of girls would paint their faces like that or, no. that's one thing I love. I love making a mask myself. You want me to stuff toilet paper in my bra and pull it out? Okay. Like, um, <laughs> like wow. anything you want me to make an ass of myself? Uh, absolutely. Especially uh, my favorite, uh, my favorite moment was at Slammiversary in Nashville when Showtime Eric Young and Robert were working and Showtime went to pull my pants down he actually accidentally pulled my underwear and my pants down, but I didn't tell them I had the ugliest granny panties on in the world. Oh, my God. Like, the beige, they were ripped. They were so ugly. And I, I didn't tell uh, Robert or Showtime. 
So they're expecting me to have a sexy thong on. I was like, why? I'm a bad girl. Why would I have a sexy thong on? So I think I, they kind of – I didn't mean to pop them, but I kind of did. That's really funny. It's like one of those things that, uh, again, I mean, people see that. Why was she wearing granny panties? Is that part of a storyline? No, she just did it. You know? Well, that's the thing is it's uh, you would expect me to have sex and wear on. And I yelled, I think it's laundry day, and I pulled my pants back up. Oh, my God. So it's just things like that that you have to – you would expect me to have a sexy song on, but that's what the crowd would want to see, and I don't want to give the crowd what they wanted to see. But see, but that's, I think that's awesome. That's one of the things that I think sometimes is lost in the business is that so many heels are concerned, and, and I guess maybe because people flip from heel to baby face so often that yeah. they, they're always so worried about being cool and I want to make her. But, I mean, really the days of, of the honky tonk man infuriating people as a kid, you know, I mean, those yeah. sometimes feel like they're over where people, they're afraid to really truly be hated because they, they don't get that it's what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I, I love to be hated. I love the challenge of getting the crowd to boo me. It's hard when you go to an indie and you're a girl on TV, even if you're a heel. It's hard because you're a, you're half the time a hot chick coming into a promotion and, you know, your boobs are pushed up and you're in a little outfit, so it's hard to get people to boo you. But that's what I love is being so annoying and obnoxious that I want a girl to chase, like, a time down south I fell into a guy's lap and his wife literally chased me around the ring. Oh, and like she had to be tackled and put on, you know, she had to have oxygen put on her. It was awesome. Like to me, that's what I, I did my job. Wow. That's like the old days. Skandar Akbar used to talk about people throwing ass at him, and it would be like a battle scar. He'd be so proud of it. But I mean, nowadays it's kind of the equivalent. Yeah, and I think it, it's that's I don't know. Some people don't get it. Some people don't get that, and some people do. But again, I think that's just the way the business is this day. So you can't fight it. No, exactly. Well, Tracy. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Before I let you go, we give all of our guests a chance to talk directly to their fans. So uh, what do you have to – I was going to say uh, Tracy Brooks maniacs out there, but obviously not being a Hulk maniac, all the, uh, all, all the Tracy little – Don't that my little tag little either. <laughs> what do you have to say to them? Uh, just thank you very much for always supporting me, and, and make sure you follow me on Twitter at the Tracy Brooks. And uh, you guys, you know, you're, you're the reason I'm not a pig farmer. You're the reason I'm not covered in pig crap. <laughs> Exactly. Well, thank you, fans, for that. And, guys, uh, be sure to check Tracy out on, on Twitter. We'll have the interview uh, up today. Tracy, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you, James. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.